Well, good evening. My name is Uta Poige, and I'm the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities here at Northeastern. And it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this evening's Schulman Lecture. We have a good audience in the room here in 909, as well as a good audience online. And what that means for those of us who can actually see us speaking, and those of you who can see actually see us speaking here, is that we sort of need to hover close to this microphone. So just have no feeling about where we are all situated, it's necessary for inclusiveness of the audience. The Schulman Lecture is really always a special occasion in our academic year. It's put on by the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice, and it is always an occasion where the school comes together with the Community Advisory Board, the Community Advisory Board, which is now the Community Advisory Board of the new Center on Crime, Race, and Justice, just recently launched by the school in order to highlight the various important research community-engaged and policy-engaged research streams that the school has. We are really, really thrilled to have a very distinguished speaker today. And I will, without further ado, turn the mic over to Amy Farrell, who's the director of the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. I really look forward to your talk tonight and very much look forward to an animated discussion after the um, talk as well. Amy. Welcome, everyone. I'm so pleased that we have a full room. It's nice to be in person. We've had to do this over Zoom for a few years, and it's great to be back here in person. And I can't imagine a more wonderful person to be welcoming than Catherine Russell Brown, who's joining us today. So before we do some basic inter introductions and we turn the floor over to Catherine, um, I just wanted to give a few, t a few quick thank yous. Um, these type of events would not be possible without a lot of people pitching in to help. Um, and so I want to recognize um, uh, many people, uh, just a couple of people today. There are many people to be thanked, and I just want to, most of all, want to thank uh, Lisa Laguerre, who has been the rock of organization for this entire event. Catherine has had a very full day. I'm sure she's tired already. Um, and so thanks to Lisa for your organizational efforts. Um, thanks to Rachel San Giacomo for getting you all to this room, as well as the 60-some people that are watching on the live stream for helping to market this event and make it possible. Um, I want to thank our community advisory board members here, Sam Williams, who's here representing the CAB leadership, the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice faculty, our friends at CLEAR, who are co-sponsoring this event with the law school. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to the Institute on Race and Justice founding director and now Professor Emeritus Jack McDevitt, for whom this speaker series was his vision, um, for whom continues to provide thought leadership to his colleagues, and for whom none of this would be possible. So thank you, Jack. And without further ado, Catherine Russell Brown is the Levin and Maybe and Levin Professor of Law and Director of the Race, Crime, uh, Race and Crime Center at the University of Florida, um, Levin College of Law. Uh, prior to joining the University of Florida uh, in 2003, uh, Professor Russell Brown taught criminology and criminal justice at the University of Maryland for 11 years. Um, she teaches in research and writes on issues of race and crime and the sociology of law. Her article, one of many, The Constitutionality of Jury Overrides in the Alabama Death Penalty Cases, was cited by the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Harris v. Alabama in 1995. She's written a number of important books in the area of race and justice, including The Color of Crime, should be a mandatory textbook for anyone teaching issues of race and justice, Criminal Law, Protecting Our Own Race, Crime, and African Americans, and Underground Codes, Race, Crime, and Related Fires. She has also written several children's picture books, including Little Melba and Her Big Trombone, A Voice Named Aretha and She Was First, The Trailblazing Life of Shirley Chisholm, which received the 2001 NAACP Image Award. Something I didn't know about Catherine. <laughs> so please join me for welcoming Catherine to today's Shulman Lecture. Hello and good evening. Um, greatly appreciate seeing so many people and greatly appreciate you taking some time to come uh, this, this evening. Um, I want to thank uh, Professor Amy Farrell for organizing uh, all of this and Professor McDevitt uh, as well. It's been uh, a wonderful day. I've had an opportunity to meet with graduate students uh, this morning to meet with 
the um, uh, CJ, the CRJ um, Community Advisory Board, and to meet with um, other students that I've bumped into uh, in the hallway. Uh, and it's just been uh, a wonderful opportunity to talk about uh, all of the great things that are happening here uh, at the university. And there are so many different pockets and so many different people uh, who are doing uh, race-related scholarship. It's really a joy to be here and kind of be in uh, the mix, albeit for uh, one day. <laughs> um, there are, as I noted, uh, as you know, numerous scholars doing uh, race-related research. I want to just give a nod to Professor Debbie Ramirez, I mentioned uh, Jack McDevitt, Margaret Burnham, uh, Carlos Cuevos, of course, Amy uh, as well, uh, and Kevin Draculich. And I want to give a nod to Professor Patricia Williams, whose work has really been uh, seminal in helping me make some connections uh, across the law and across social sciences. And in a particularly uh, moving piece, I believe it was a spirit murder uh, piece, there's a discussion about law versus justice. And that really helped me to frame a lot of my thinking about uh, what we're looking at and what we're talking about when we're uh, examining uh, the law. So uh, a shout out uh, to Professor uh, Williams. And I also want to say, um, as Professor Farrell said, thank you to Lisa Lerier for um, helping with all the moving, creating the moving parts and helping put them <laughs> in order. Uh, so it's been a wonderful day, a wonderful visit, and it's great to be someplace that has a fall. Uh, because there's no fall in Florida. There's just degrees of hotness. And uh, now, and with the turn to the focus on um, the article that I'm going to draw my talk from today, the hotness is also political. It's not just about the, uh, about the heat. Uh, the talk uh, this evening, uh, Florida Stop Woke Act, History, Race, Literacy, and Law, um, I want to just draw your attention to this painting by Jacob Lawrence called The Library. He actually did more than one painting called The Library, but this is the 1960 version. And I thought it really encapsulated uh, what the focus is uh, in terms of the, the talk and the comments that I will make about, um, in particular, African Americans wanting to learn, striving to learn, striving to uh, read and uh, become and continue uh, becoming educated. And before I go any further, um, I want to thank uh, my research assistant, who's not here, Madison Jenkins, who's a second year uh, law student who is responsible for finding all of the graphics that you will see uh, this evening, including this one. So um, I just wanted to, uh, to note that uh, as well. So my talk this evening is based upon a paper uh, that will soon be published in uh, a law review article, um, NYU's Review of Law and Social Change. And I came to writing this piece after, like many of you, over the last year and a half, uh, watching, listening as uh, school boards, uh, teachers, uh, parents, students, uh, politicians uh, engaged in a heated, to battle, heated battle on what was appropriate for the classroom or for classroom uh, learning. And watching uh, all of this over the last uh, year and a half, couple of years, uh, a few different things um, to me are, are worth noting. One, the lightning speed at which legislation has been passed that would ban books, that would change what kinds of curriculum uh, schools have, uh, that's one, and the challenges uh, overall to in inclusive, progressive education, they've just happened so quickly and also that these laws uh, are very broad in their uh, sweep. 
And they're not just focused on, for example, elementary school, uh, but many of these laws expand to a much longer uh, educational time frame. And in particular, the HB7 law that I will discuss is not K through 5, not K through 9, not K through 12, but is K through 20. So it applies to public education that continues into college, into uh, graduate studies, into professional studies, you know, medical school, law school. And so that was striking to me as well that this uh, legislation was uh, extending and reaching and covering a much larger group uh, than some of the earlier laws. And then the third concern that I had uh, as I continued to watch these laws being passed and these arguments and debates about what's appropriate for classroom uh, learning has been just how devastating uh, these laws will be in terms of what uh, kinds of information and education takes place in the classroom. And I've wondered and really worried a lot about what that would mean for those of us who teach and research and write on issues related to race. So with all of that, I was motivated to examine this new Florida law that just went into effect on July 1. <laughs> Thanks. And so the language that's, uh, that has been kind of adopted around the law is that it's called, it's the Stop Woke Act. Uh, and so what does that stand for? And it's actually, there's a, there's a couple of uh, ways that the law is uh, it, it's kind of titled. Uh, the Stop the Wrongs Against Our Kids and Employees Act. Uh, but another uh, is the Stop the Wrongs to Our Kids and Employees Act, but it's the, it's the, same, uh, the same material. So that's uh, what the law means. And also the kind of the, the second piece of it, it's, it's also known as the Individual Freedom Act. Okay. So in thinking about HB 7, I thought about how historically the law has been used as a tool to prevent literacy and learning. Uh, there's a well-established history of anti-literacy. Uh, and um, in looking at this, I wanted to use that history as kind of a foundational space for making sense of HB7. So my goal in looking at this law, which we'll spend some time uh, kind of looking at the different, uh, some different parts of it, uh, but was to understand the law in context and not as just an isolated piece of legislation, uh, not to talk about it as a discrete phenomenon, not to talk about it as just a part of the ongoing uh, cultural wars or a reflection of the ongoing a racial divide in the country, not just a backlash uh, from the, the protests following you know, George Floyd's uh, murder. Uh, I wanted specifically to create some historical, political, and racial grounding for understanding what it means uh, for the state to pass laws that limit and ban knowledge and exposure of students to particular bodies of law. Okay, so anti-literacy is the framework that uh, I've, uh, I'm using to look at. Thanks, just be able to one more back, please. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about, um, or divide the talk into three parts. Uh, one, to provide an overview of uh, in history of anti-literacy laws, uh, then to review HB 7, the actual text of the legislation tied to uh, specifically to race, and that will include a look at some scenarios, uh, some hypothetical scenarios, and then just to talk about what some of the far-reaching consequences are uh, of the law. Okay. 
Thanks. I usually don't have help, so this is great. <laughs> um, so first, with regard to anti-literacy laws, um, looking back at antebellum laws, including the slave codes and black laws, uh, laws in uh, jurisdictions and, uh, that had states as well as in uh, free states alike, prohibited or in some ways restricted education for black people. Uh, in the 1700s, uh, during colonial times, some laws distinguished actually between um, prohibiting reading and writing. Reading in some instances was permissible uh, as it would allow enslaved blacks to read the Bible. And this was considered uh, positive uh, as it promoted um, uh, docility uh, and promoted, um, uh, many believe, uh, promoted uh, slavery. Writing, however, was not permissible and was prohibited as it would allow, uh, as concerns were that it would allow enslaved blacks to, to write themselves passes uh, and uh, possibly use those passes to, uh, to escape. No, not quite. <laughs> in the 1800s, however, slaveholders and slaveholding states began to retreat, excuse me, began to treat reading and writing as subversive. Okay? And these represented a combination, these concerns, particularly around the 1820s, concerns um, fell into a few different categories. One fears that enslaved persons would come together and plan ways to escape. Two, there were concerns about increased calls for abolition. Three, there were fears that enslaved Christians would lead anti-slavery revolts, such as Nat Turner in Virginia. Uh, and there were concerns about published writings by free blacks who spoke out against slavery, such as David Walker right here in, um, in Boston. Okay, let's look at some of these laws, some examples. So here are a few examples of Virginia, Louisiana, and North Carolina. And so let's just read these. Um, in Virginia, uh, should free Negroes or their children assemble at a school to learn reading or writing? Any justice of the peace may dismiss the school with, uh, with 20 stripes um, on the back of every pupil. Louisiana, the penalty for instructing a free black in a Sunday school is for the first offense, $500. For the second offense, death. And in North Carolina, to teach a slave to read or write or to sell or give him any book, Bible not accepted or pamphlet is punished with 39 lashes or imprisonment if the offender be a free Negro, but if a white, then with a fine of $200. The reason of this law, this is a critical, reason of this law assigned in the preamble is that teaching slaves to read and write tends to excite dissatisfaction in their minds and produce insurrection and uh, rebellion. Okay. And so we can note the harsh punishments uh, uh, for violations of these laws and even distinctions based upon uh, race and status in terms of who uh, gets punished and, you know, this concerns both physical punishment uh, and the lashes. And in the history of the slave codes, the, these numbers have some uh, meaning and a punishment of more than 39 lashes or stripes was said to uh, impose some uh, biblical sanctions. So the, you see on the slave codes uh, a lot of you know, uh, punishments that were right at 39 um, lashes. But I, I think it's, um, you know, kind of right there in, um, you know, um, in, in writing what the uh, level of punishment there is uh, for blacks, free blacks, uh, enslaved blacks learning to read and, 
what these sanctions were uh, that attached. Okay? And so there was a real fear um, uh, from whites uh, that education and learning would fill a person up uh, with ideas about freedom and rights and justice. Okay? So in many ways, uh, reading was a revolutionary act. Okay? And so we have some here, some they're not the easiest to see, um, but of uh, black people reading, um, being read to. Um, that was um, uh, good to, to look at as well. So uh, reading remained really an edu uh, a revolutionary mm -hmm. act for black people during and uh, after uh, the Civil War. And following the Civil War, there was a range of laws that prohibited and limited black education. Okay? Black schools were grossly underfunded, uh, and schools were <laughs> uh, really uh, viewed as a fundamental, fundamental vehicle to uh, freedom. Okay? Uh, schools, uh, in the way that they could teach, uh, in the way that, uh, you know, the material that was available uh, was seen as essential to uh, true freedom uh, for blacks. Um, in terms of other ways, uh, other responses to attempts at literacy, uh, in addition to black schools being underfunded, there were also uh, racial terror incidents where black schools were burned down. Okay? Um, in, uh, between 1866 and 1876, more than 600 black southern schools were burned down. Also, uh, there were movements to limit uh, the types of education that black children would be exposed to. And examples of this included uh, black teachers uh, being required to sign anti-NAACP <clears throat> oaths. Okay. Uh, and this was, and this is a Louisiana law uh, uh, drawn on here, uh, but other states as well had legislation designed to uh, make it uh, not possible for teachers to uh, be members of the NAACP. So the oath, uh, there's many questions, but these are at the core. Do you belong to the NAACP? Do you support the NAACP in any way, through money, through donations, or by attending uh, meetings? Okay. Do you favor the integration of races in schools? And do you believe in the aims of the NAACP? So this is an example from uh, Louisiana, and the teachers here um, in the photograph are those who uh, had been asked to part to sign oaths and who in different ways had lost their uh, positions as a result of, of that. Okay. Um, the Georgia Board of Education passed resolutions that stated that any teacher who supports or encourages racially mixed classes would have their license revoked forever. Okay, so there's this hyper management of black education. So, in addition to the required oaths, there were mandated curricula. Okay, and Professor Jarvis Gibbons, in his new book, his last year new book uh, called Fugitive Pedagogy, examines the tireless, stalwart efforts of black educators uh, in the early 1920s. Okay. Okay. And again, he labels this fugitive uh, pedagogy. And uh, we want to note as well um, that this, this term that he uses uh, is used to describe how black educators responded to restrictive educational laws, how those educators made sure 
to teach more than simply learning to read and learning to write to black children. These teachers were determined to teach black students about their history, so they met the mandate of maintaining an open display of the approved outline or pre-approved outlines that were designated by the State Board of Education, but, but some of the teachers hid alternate educational lesson plans in their laps, okay? so that in case they were visited uh, by white administrators uh, in their classrooms, they could sort of hide this uh, alternative or these al alternative or alternate uh, school lessons. Okay? So the legal and social restrictions on black learning meant that oftentimes black education was taught in pieces. Okay? And that black people, it's been described, some of the language to describe education uh, under those uh, restrictions uh, is that black people had to snatch their education. Formal education wasn't always available. It wasn't always consistently available over time, the way we tend to think of education. You go X number of years for X amount of time each year. Uh, education on black light and progress was not always available. So there was this idea of getting something and keeping it and getting something else and keeping it. Um, and that was the kind of the trajectory for obtaining uh, education. Okay. So I'd like to now <laughs> uh, look at uh, this slide uh, that I want to talk a little bit about that um, sort of uh, encapsulates what we're looking at. So the basic laws, and by basic anti-literacy laws, I'm talking about the laws that we looked at, and that is those laws that prohibit basic uh, reading and writing, okay? And so those, you know, came through loud and clear with the slave codes, the black laws, which were laws that applied in free states, uh, black codes coming about after uh, the Civil War, uh, Jim Crow. And so these really are linked together, okay? And they're linked together in terms of what the prohibitions uh, were, but also there's another piece. So in addition to basic anti-literacy laws and practices, there are laws that I'm labeling substantive anti-literacy laws that are focused on, and, and HB 7 is really kind of the encapsulation uh, of it, um, laws that are designed to restrain and restrict what students can be exposed to. And in some ways, I'd consider them sort of next level laws. And the line isn't just, it's not just kind of a continuous line that, oh, at one point we had basic anti-literacy laws, then now today we have uh, only substantive uh, anti-literacy laws. They work together. I mean, we can see the black codes, we can see Jim Crow, they're working, um, they're, they're, they're both together and, um, and separate. So these sort of next level laws, and again, the examples, the NAACP oath, right, these laws that are preventing teachers from teaching about freedom or teaching about equality or teaching about history, about black success or black, um, uh, you know, modeling, uh, uh, you know, uh, black progress. Okay, so these laws are designed to tamp down uh, information and engagement of, of African Americans in larger society. So in addition to uh, these laws that are listed here, we could also list uh, other kinds of actions uh, as well uh, that come about as a result of these substantive anti-literacy laws whether it's white flight, school to prison uh, pipeline, uh, rise in police in uh, schools. Okay. So by adopting substantive anti-literacy laws and practices, the state, 
the government determines which subjects and perspectives are important and appropriate for the educational curriculum in public schools. Okay. These laws and practices that punish or limit whole areas of substantive research, okay, such as histories and cultures and perspectives and narratives. And once this happens, once the state is making these determinations, the state is now actively engaged in anti-literacy, regardless of what label they give it. Okay. Okay. And so let's look at you know, a quote from a historian, and this is from 2001. From the perspective of history, governments promoting literacy through campaigns or even just through universal education have not necessarily done so with the view of promoting individual freedom. Rather, they've wished to inculcate their own political or religious agenda and promote social control. Okay, so this idea that you know, this, that, oh, everyone's entitled to an education, public education is free, and we're doing this to uh, carry out the goal of individual freedom. And that's why I noted uh, at the outset that the, the subtitle of the HB7 law is individual, an individual freedom act, okay? So even though that's what the law says it is, it doesn't mean, and this is why I wanted to, there's a quote by the historian um, uh, Monaghan, is that we can, we can raise questions uh, and wonder uh, and, and take a look at what the state's goals are based on the practice and not just based upon the label that's used to, uh, to carry out the law. So the objective for both basic and substantive anti-literacy practices, separate and together, is to control what blacks learn about themselves and the country. Now I want to note that these laws are not just targeted at African Americans. Okay? Substantive, substantive anti-literacy laws are also deeply concerned with and focused on keeping white people as well from learning about U.S. racial history. Okay? And we see strains of this in looking at the, uh, the legislation uh, that, we, that was on the board a little bit ago where there were punishments for whites as well for teaching literacy. And so we can see that that strain carries through to uh, later day laws such as HB 7, that whites too are prohibited from learning critical racial perspectives. Okay. All right, let's turn to the text of the HB 7 law. Thank you. Um, we're going to skip past that. Um, to keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep, go ahead, go ahead. Not going to get to that. Okay. Uh, let's look at the, the language of the law itself. Okay. All right, so there are eight parts to the law and I want to read through them and then we'll look at some hypotheticals and see um, whether or not they violate the law or what we, what we can figure out based on the language of this legislation. As I said, went into effect in July. So under HB 7, it constitutes discrimination to subject any student, and I highlight student, not employee, because that's the focus of the uh, of, of my examination is on how this in, uh, impacts the classroom. So it, it constitutes discrimination to subject any student or employee to instruction or training that, quote, espouses, promotes, advances, inculcates, or compels such student or employee to believe any of the following concepts. Okay, so it's, a, it's discrimination to Let's take a look at it. <laughs> and I summarize that the language that I just read here at the top. Um, it is discrimination to teach in a way that compels a student to believe that members of one race, okay, color, national origin, or sex, are morally superior to members of another race, color, so forth. 
national origin or sex. Second, a person by virtue of his or her race, color, national origin, or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. A person's, and we'll come back to this, I just want to get what the language is, a person's moral character or status as either privileged or oppressed is necessarily determined by his or her race, color, national origin, or sex. Again, it's discrimination to teach in a way that compels a student to believe that members of one race, color, national origin, or sex cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to race, color, national origin, or um, sex. Part five, a person by virtue of his or her race, color, national origin, or sex bears responsibility for, and so again, it's that, it's discrimination to teach that um, uh, in a way that compels a student to believe that a person who, uh, that, that a person bears responsibility for or should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment because of actions committed in the past by others. So that could be a, a, about reparations. That could be a discussion about reparations. If that's it, interpreted to mean that a person who's teaching is attempting to get students to, um, to believe that reparations are appropriate. It could be about affirmative action. Okay? Again, it's discrimination, the teaching a way that uh, compels a student to believe that a person, by virtue of his or her race, should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment to achieve diversity, equity, or inclusion. Okay, same concerns uh, raised there uh, as well. Okay, because it appears to prohibit. Um, any kind of corrective actions for past discrimination. Okay. Seven, a person by virtue of his or her race so forth, bears personal responsibility for and must feel guilt, anguish, or other forms of psychological distress because of actions in which the person played no part committed in the past by other members of the same race color or national uh, origin or sex. Okay? So this seems to say that no material or arguments that suggest uh, that whites should feel guilty or shame for uh, behavior engaged in by other whites. So what if a professor is having a discussion uh, about uh, lynching, uh, about, you know, looking at lynching photography, uh, you know, it's, so some questions are raised about just exactly uh, what the expanse of this language is. And then the final and last section, uh, number eight, says that it's discrimination to teach in a way that compels students to believe that such virtues as merit, excellence, hard work, Fairness, neutrality, objectivity, and racial colorblindness are racist or sexist, or were created by members of a particular race, color, national origin uh, to, to, to oppress members of another race. Okay? So this is, there's a lot here. Um, and so one of the key questions is, what does all of this mean? What is it, what, how is it applied? And what can be taught, what can't be taught. So a few things. One is that we don't know. <laughs> the answer is we don't know. And we don't know because there has not been a um, kind of a reckoning around um, challenges to the law. I mean, there have been legal challenges. But in terms of actual cases where complaints have been filed and uh, you know, someone has been accused of teaching in a discriminatory way. But the language suggests, and I, I think eight is a good one, and I'll come to kind of the ultimate pro 
uh, proviso in just a moment that follows this. Um, this idea here, and I think this kind of, th this is representative, I think, of what HB7 is designed to do. So the language here is saying that talking about merit, talking about colorblindness, talking about hard work, language of hard work, fairness, neutrality, objectivity, uh, and saying that those are racist ways of explaining uh, language or, or uh, uh, using language as ways to kind of cover up systemic uh, racism or to cover up white supremacy or to cover up uh, ways of understanding why some people succeed and some people do not succeed. Um, by this very language, what HB7 is telling us is that teachers are not allowed to say that that language itself is sexist or racist. Okay? So this is a clear uh, statement as to, <laughs> as to what is permissible in terms of perceptions. One of the biggest concerns is because we haven't seen how it's played out as far as um, you know, actions taken against someone being accused of violating HB7 is we don't know what it means. And if, you, if we can go back just several to the top of, yeah, keep one more, one more, yeah. So it's the last three lines here. What constitutes promoting or advancing or espousing or inculcating uh, or compelling students to believe? So where is the line between teaching and promoting something else or, or compelling students to believe something? And I think part of the, one of the key issues here is we don't know the answer to that and it's left up in the air in terms of how it will be determined. If, if, a, if a teacher lays out, if a professor lays out what a particular, um, in a particular area of empirical research, well, let me, get to, let, let me go to the, um, the scenarios because that ties in, but let me give you the, uh, one more. So what the legislation says, after all of those things, it says this law may not be construed to prohibit discussion of the concepts listed, in there, listed therein as part of a larger course of training or instruction, provided such training or instruction is given in an objective manner without endorsement of the concept. So basically, this, you know, this, this follow-up language at the end of the things, the eight things that constitute discrimination uh, says, here at the end, well, if you teach in an objective manner without endorsement of any concepts, you're safe. Well, so what ultimately does that mean? You're safe if you teach in an objective manner without endorsement. So what that suggests is that we're not supposed to give our opinion. Now, what if your opinion is based, is empirically based, right? It's based on research. So it, in in this way kind of strips the instructor of the ability to share with students okay, the reasoning behind a particular point of view or argument where it's based upon uh, research or you know e empirical data so um, so let's take a look at some scenarios um, and before getting there, I just want to say that the sanctions are great for violation. Great, not great meaning, <laughs> not, not good, but, uh, <laughs> but hefty. Uh, so there's a private cause of action uh, that can lead to uh, payment of up to, a uh, fine of up to $100,000. There's uh, for punitive, well, it's, there's a lot going on here, but there's a private cause of action you know, a student could sue a professor. The state AG uh, attorney general could initiate a civil action. There are other actions that can take place. Uh, loss of employment, of course, being uh, one of the more serious. But this one is very serious. Loss of university performance funding. So included in the bill was 
well, the, the language comes from several different pieces of legislation, but included is that the university can lose millions of dollars if there are substantiated uh, cases of discrimination. Okay? And so with this in mind, uh, and as part of the, uh, as part of this legislation, uh, at the college level, uh, there is a point person for HB7, and there are, um, there's language, you know, across the university websites. Uh, interestingly, uh, the, uh, the language and the kind of unpacking of the legislation is uh, under the um, DEI, the, the Chief Diversity uh, officers uh, webpage, so that's where this uh, this is housed. And if we go to, I think there's this. We're going to start the. Okay, yeah. So let's, yeah. So let's let's look at uh, some uh, some hypotheticals. Okay. All right. We can go to the next one. All right. So scenario number one. Okay. So in advance of a discussion on reparations. Professor B assigns an article by author Ta-Nehisi Coates. The article argues in favor of specific forms of reparations for African Americans. Okay, so first question is, is it okay to assign that? Okay, is it okay? Well, it seems like it's okay to assign it, but the question that hangs in the air is, is this legislation now really putting into place both sides language. So you have a piece that is in favor of reparations. Does that mean now the professor is supposed to have another piece that's against reparations? Like exactly what? And it's just, it's just not clear okay, what HB7 requires. It could be interpreted as no problem, but is assigning it an example of espousing or compelling, right? So where, again, is that, that line? Okay. Okay. And so the question of whether or not it, it requires a um, kind of a both sides approach is left. Okay. The second scenario, thanks. So Professor D teaches a race, crime, and law course. She's compiled a list of over 200 terms, concepts, etc. Uh, and these topics are essential to understanding U.S. criminal legal structures and how law, crime, and race intersect. Professor D has her students review and discuss this race and crime literacy list. Again, is that okay? We don't know. Okay, so it's unclear whether or not if there's one list, does there have to be another list? Is it just how the list is taught? Okay, and this is what the concern really is with, uh, with HB7, uh, because it, it suggests that professors, instructors, are now having to kind of reroute how subjects are taught and sort of step out of uh, the way of the material that's being taught, right? And so this is highly, uh, this is highly problematic. Okay. All right. Let's look at the third scenario. Professor J teaches criminal law. He typically arrives for class uh, 15 minutes or so early. Students who arrive early approach him and ask questions about the material, his opinion on court decisions and so forth, and his thoughts about national news events that involve issues of crime and race. After class, Professor Jay is also approached by students with questions about the material and his opinions. Okay. So under HB 7, is Professor Jay allowed to share his opinion. Okay. Well, under HB 7, instructors are to provide students with information, but it's not clear that opinions, again, are welcome. OK. 
Okay, um, so we've got information, then we've got knowledge, uh, which is sort of the synthesis, right, of uh, synthesis and logical conclusion drawn from information, but this looks to be a question mark here. Okay, so this idea of and concern with what professors can share in terms of their own personal uh, opinions um, really uh, strikes at the core. This it shows that HB7 really strikes at the core of a professor's expertise. Okay, uh, and if not in the if, if what if a student asks for a prof asks rather a professor his or her opinion uh, before class or after class? Does the site of the inquiry matter? Does it matter whether it's uh, before class or in the hallway or in uh, office hours and uh, the legislation has been discussed in terms of what information has been available that um, there's kind of a broad, we we'll won't call it a long arm, but there's a broad, uh, you know, expanse of the law. So it's not just before class, it's not just after class, it's also office hours. So all of this is considered uh, under what the Board of Governors has um, defined as instruction. So instruction isn't just uh, in uh, the classroom, okay? And a professor's opinion doesn't, ap doesn't appear to um, matter the source of the opinion, okay? Whether it's empirically validated uh, or not. Okay. Scenario four. Okay. Professor R teaches an undergraduate sociology of law course, which includes a section on race-related terminology uh, and its impact on politics and state policies. And as part of the reading uh, and analysis of the topic, the professor has their students read works by scholars who discuss the origins and applications of terms such as colorblind, objectivity, neutrality, and merit. These scholars conclude that these terms are problematic because they lionize the concepts of impartiality and universal truths. So where would HB7 fall on that? Is that a violation of the law? Well, it sounds like it, because if we go back to, we can go up. Just quickly back up to eight and we'll come back here. One more, one more, right there. So it's right here. It's discrimination to teach in a way that compels students to believe that talking about merit or excellence is racist, okay, or racially problematic. Okay, so we can back to four, sorry. Um, yeah, so that, that sounds like, and that, that's, and just, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to talk about this and sound like I'm, you know, uh, being dispassionate, right? Um, but this is highly problematic, right? This is uh, concerning that these are questions that a professor needs to, or instructor needs to think about as they are, are entering a classroom and addressing some of, uh, some of, these, uh, some of these topics. Okay. And so, again, it doesn't seem to matter that the uh, conclusions of these science, uh, social scientists who have looked at this issue, uh, you know, that this is kind of a uniform conclusion. The, the law says that you, you cannot talk about these things as being uh, racist or racially uh, driven. Okay. All right. Uh, just a couple more here. Number five. So Professor X teaches a death penalty course at a law school and invites a well-known death penalty defense attorney to speak with his class. The guest speaker expresses his opposition to capital punishment and references empirical studies that show stark racial disparities in application, in their application. So, first of all, I want to note that the way that HB7 has been written is that a guest lecturer becomes a temporary employee of the university. 
Okay, you go one more down, please. So there's a whole section on guest, <laughs> guest speakers <laughs> <laughs> under the law. Uh, and it's not in the law, written in the law, but this is what's on the page at the University of Florida on the Chief Diversity Officer's page in terms of an interpretation of what HB 7 means. So if a, guest lecture, if a guest speaker is providing instruction or training with the authorization of the university or, in, or, in, or any of its employees, that speaker may be considered a university instructor under HB 7 laws. And the university recommends that when a guest lecturer is invited into instruction or training, the inviting employee must pro is to provide the guest lecturer a copy of the HB 7 laws. And the guest speaker should be asked if their presentation and materials are consistent with the HB 7 laws. So that makes that the professor now is part of the machine uh, driving um, the application of the law and now has some duties beyond curriculum, uh, you know, presenting and, and creating curriculum. Um, and we're also told here if they are, well, okay, so the guest speaker should be asked if their presentation and materials are consistent with the law, and if they're not, the guest speaker must modify them or the presentation should be canceled. There's one more after this. Yes, and then it goes, you know, there's more. Uh, if the guest speaker acts um, inconsistent with the law, the employee that has authorized the speaker must take action to remedy the situation. This is a lot. <laughs> uh, and in fact, um, the Race and Crime Center for Justice, we, you know, we have speakers who come. And so we recently sent this to a speaker. And it just, it's hard to describe what it's like to have to send this to someone giving a, just a talk. <laughs> uh, luckily, it was OK. And you know everything was uh, fine, but the idea that um, in some ways the instructors are being asked to kind of monitor uh, uh, not only what's said, but in advance of it. So if you're getting this adva in advance, one, how many people are still going to give a talk with that in mind with the concern that they might be violating a uh, state law? Uh, and secondly, how might they change are they likely to change what they were going to say um, because they're now going to be uh, you know, a, a temporary employee at the university uh, based, upon, uh, based upon their uh, speech? So this gives some, you know, this, this potentially could give uh, some uh, pause. Uh, and so it leads to, okay. <laughs> Oh, we're going to skip those two. We're going to okay. skip two, two, one more. Okay. So it leads to, let's call a big question. Who's in charge, right? Who's in charge of public school curriculum and pedagogy in Florida? <laughs> Students, instructors, deans, the provost, the university president, the board of trustees, the governor, the board of governors, right? So question mark. Uh, but it doesn't seem like it's the instructors. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's the, the students, right? So with this, uh, with this legislation uh, in mind, there are a lot of uh, unanswered, a lot of unanswered uh, questions. Uh, and I want to just say, okay, um, I just want to say just a, a few more things. Let's go to. Let's see what's on the next slide. <laughs> okay, We're, there have been some challenges. Let, let's let's continue. So what I wanted to say, and I mentioned this uh, earlier uh, in some conversations earlier today, that HB seven is just a piece of some larger pieces of legislation that are all sort of working together that sort of uh, uh, push out, um, uh, you know, kind of where things are, wh where we are around race race-related issues, um, and not just in curriculum. So there's this explicit prohibition of, of critical uh, race theory. And I just wanted to make a one quick comment on that. Um, 
We'll come to that. So, okay, so, um, yeah, and, and, and there were, so the, the State Board of Education banned CRT <laughs> over, I guess, a year, year and a half ago, and looking at that uh, language that was used, I mean, they, they talk about critical race theory and make it comparable to Holocaust denial. You know, that's a language uh, that is used. Um, students are allowed to tape professors. Now, Florida happens to be a two-party state where you're not, you know, you're only supposed to be allowed to tape if the other person who's being taped says it's okay. But under this law, students can tape um, and they don't have to ask our permission. So they can do it secretly or they can do it right in front of us. We don't need to give them permission. Now, they can't just, you know, tape us and then send it out over, um, you know, social media, it has to be done uh, as a way to, to build a case. But again, think of what message that's sending instructors in the classroom. Uh, we've, there's also been developed these viewpoint surveys that uh, have been done already once. And these viewpoint surveys for faculty and staff at universities, public universities across the state have, um, uh, have questions about uh, points of view about uh, you know conservatives conservative as opposed to liberal perspectives whether you think your voice is heard whether you think there's ample opportunity uh, to you know share your views whether you're comfortable uh, and so there's these new viewpoint surveys there's voter redistricting there's you know parents uh, as I mentioned a, a little bit ago uh, having a right to uh, so, so there's all these things, and these are just a few of them, but there are all these other things working together uh, really to quell uh, what, can, um, you know, what can happen in the classroom. Okay. Right. So in some ways, thanks, in some ways there's really uh, uh, the potential for a great domino effect as a result of HB7. So instructors might avoid um, teaching race-focused courses, particularly instructors who are not tenured. Instructors might avoid addressing race issues in classes that don't specifically focus on race, um, where they might have in the past but would be less likely to now, and that it's less likely that new race-focused courses would be developed under this uh, under these new rules for how race can be talked about in the classroom. There's also, and I use de delegitimization, but I'd say more, I, I'd probably change that term to uh, kind of a devaluing of race scholars and race scholarship. Um, since the law is grounded on, uh, in the assumption that race is marginal and, and something kind of, uh, uh, you know, unwelcome in terms of a, of a, a paradigm for analysis. And so there's some question whether or not that would have some tie or some push uh, regarding uh, majors such as African American studies. Like where will this, where will this uh, lead? Will it diminish? Will it uh, reshift DEI work? Uh, and we saw right after the law went into effect in July that a, uh, like on a number of schools' websites after the, the Floyd protests, um, people posted or posted uh, anti-racism statements. And so right after this law was passed, a number of universities in Florida pulled down their anti-racism statements. Not because they were told to or said that there was something wrong or someone challenged them, but just because they were concerned and didn't know whether or not that was going to be uh, problematic. Um, and, you know, I think the, one of the bigger concerns uh, with this legislation is that it really is promoting kind of widespread ignorance about race and race-related uh, topics. Okay? So, in conclusion, <laughs> uh, a fully operational HB7 will enable a purge of race scholarship and race scholars in Florida's colleges and universities. This is, a possible, this is possible as a result of the law's unequivocal targeting 
of these scholars and their scholarship. This attrition will also impact university scholars who do not teach race-related issues in their courses. And the harm extends beyond any punishments received by individual instructors. HB 7 determines which race-related knowledge students will carry with them out into the world. There is a great danger when the state unilaterally decides to ban the teaching of certain types of knowledge. HB 7 is anti-literacy masquerading in freedom's clo clothing. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Well, mm -hmm. that was a lot. <laughs> um, so we can take a breath. We need some of your deep breathing. Um, and open up for questions. Oh, over here. Over here. I have one. Um, hi, uh, my name is Jessie. I'm from uh, Media Advocacy Program. And I have a question based on the previous slide. So there's one is like students can secretly record in the class lecture. Is that coming from like during COVID? I, I, mean, I believe most of us experienced the Zoom classes. And is that like infected by the Zoom recording. Okay, so in terms of this legislation is specifically directed toward allowing students to tape a professor who they believe is doing something unlawful. Okay, so like you, we had all these different rules about, um, you know, during COVID, um, about uh, what could be, you know, basically all of our, our classes were taped. Uh, and now that we, although COVID's not gone, <laughs> now that we, um, you know, are kind of moving into another phase, professors can opt in or opt out in terms of whether or not they want their classes taped for future reference by students who have a university approved excuse for watching it. Um, but that's something separate than what this is. My name is Cheryl Daniel. I'm a media advocacy student here at Northeastern. And I have two questions for you. And I just want to say I appreciate the parallels between the Jim Crow um, and now. But I, I, so my first question is, moving forward in the future, what do politicians think that this world for these students is going to look like, right? Because racism is still prevalent. You know, there's still bias. There's still prejudice. So. Like, do they expect these students to go into the world and thrive? Mm -hmm. Like, what does that look like? And then two, my second question is, I'm a proud graduate of a historically black college, yeah. um, <laughs> Dillard University. <laughs> and, I mentioned um, Louisiana. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for like, for example, FAMU, Florida Agriculture and yeah. Mechanical University, what does that look like for them? Because it's, you know, historically black. You know, they're, they're founded on teaching blackness, promoting blackness. So when it comes to this law, how does that affect them in that way? If you could speak on that. Well, I knew this was going to happen, that I was going to forget the first question once you <laughs> ask the second one. So let, just give me a, just three words on what the first question was. I'll know. The question is, what, what do they the think is going to happen? Like yeah. So I think it's going to look, it will, if HB7 is uh, where we're going, it's <coughs> going to look like, uh, 200 years ago. It's going to look a lot different. So here, here's, here's what I want to uh, throw out there. First of all, students in K through 12 are not learning an overabundance of material on race. Like, let's just start there. That's not happening now. So the idea here is to restrain, with the book banning, is to uh, restrain what and how race is talked about. So it's even less. So the thinking is you're thinking kind of progressively and you know how um you know how this would be helpful more people know about these issues and have a better understanding of the history and all of that but that's not the goal the goal of these laws is to get us back to again as i mentioned um you know state sanctioned uh curriculum and this curriculum you know is is not going to be uh, focused on a whole lot of issues, uh, race being uh, one of them. 
So with regard to HBCUs, I, I didn't get to it, but um, there's a, a section in the paper where I talk about alternative or alternate uh, types of education and how there are Saturday schools, Sunday schools, schools, uh, you know, HBCUs uh, included in that list. Like there are these other ways that people learn and become exposed to histories that are not taught in mainstream public education. So those will always exist. And so that's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, hope, I'm certainly hopeful uh, about that. So first thing that came to my mind was, um, and this is, is uh, so there's been historically a practice of banning particular books that you can bring into prisons, right? So as you were talking, I started thinking about that, the book banning thing. Um, but, you know, as you were talking, you talked about sanctions, right? Now I think about people like William Leo Hansberry, who, like, was writing about black advancement and achievement mm -hmm. 100 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And Ivan Van Sertema mm -hmm. and Diop and mm -hmm. these scholars who really broke open an understanding of race and culture in America. Um, the impact that this will have, the social impact on black literature publication mm -hmm. industries, mm -hmm. because a lot of these individuals, they write for a living, yeah. and to yeah. get a contract with an institution, right. to have right. your book used in, yeah. a, that's huge, right? Yeah. And so if this moves forward, like it's an those economic, folks, a clear economic institutions impact. will yeah. not want to purchase their right. books, would right. not want to contract them in any way. Yeah. And so there's an even further domino Absolutely. impact economically Absolutely. on black scholars who use Absolutely. their research to help advance education. So I was thinking about that as you well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in terms of, you know, if that, so, okay, so there's a couple of things that happens. One is when books are banned, right, then there's this, this you know, increase in people buying the books. But long term, like you're saying, in terms of what's adopted in the schools, what's adopted uh, you know, in terms of what um, publishers are, are looking to publish will have an effect and will have economic consequences on uh, scholarship uh, and history uh, focused on uh, these issues. Now, I also want to note, um, or also I think we should note, that many of the, like some of the books that you were mentioning aren't on the bestseller list but have been popular and have been selling for years. So I think that won't change. But you're right in terms of this having not just an impact on what courses are offered or what scholars decide to stay at a university, but also impact the scholarship itself. Can I say one more thing? And what I've learned in those types of really popular, substantive books that have real cl uh, classical appeal, right, if you find one on Amazon, Mm -hmm. They're no longer a standard normal prices. Yeah, they're five hundred dollars. Like five hundred, a <laughs> thousand, eighteen hundred. There, right, yeah. like, like the exactly. price goes skyrocket yeah. for some. So that was the other thing that came to my mind. <laughs> so uh, first of all, thank you for coming. I think this is the first time I've been so engaged with a presentation and basically wanted to pull my hair out. It's about slide three. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you, you sort of skipped over quickly, but I was curious your thoughts about the potential success or not of the um, of the legal challenges that have come up against the, this law. I think your lawyer side. I would appreciate your lawyer side thoughts on that. Well, I just don't know. Um, I wish I, you know. Uh... Can we put that slide up? Oh, sure, sure. I, I, I mean, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, they're raising a well, First Amendment challenge, due process, the Purnell, um, the second lawsuit uh, we've got with LDF and uh, the ACLU uh, and the 14th Amendment. I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, <laughs> I'm hopeful, but I, I don't know. Yeah, and I, I also, and I, I don't think I mentioned this, but it seems to me there should be, and I didn't see it anywhere in the law, there should be some kind of reporting requirement in the law. Like, it shouldn't be that I have to file, uh, you know, for records requests to find out whether or not people 
have been charged with violating the law. Like we should have some idea of how the law is working, how it actually, um, you know, are people uh, filing uh, filing actions against professors? I mean, that's what we just we just don't know at this point. But we know that this apparatus has been put in place at colleges uh, across the uh, across the state. Can you talk a little bit about anything you've seen, maybe not specific to the University of Florida, but maybe other places, about how universities have been responding? Has there been guidance to, I, yeah, I mean, the <laughs> guest speaker guidance was a little overwhelming, but yeah. are department chairs talking about this? How is this actually filtering down to? Yeah, I don't have a comprehensive sense, um, but I can say that a number of, many professors are sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, you know, people are teaching in the ways they've been teaching, but they're mindful of the law, but they're not really sure how it's going to apply. So they're kind of, you know, going forward, but we just don't know. It's just not clear yet how this is going to, um, you know, how it's going to play out. But I can say, I mean, as I guess was part of what you were commenting on, just the idea that, that you have, that there's a, a specific amount of time that has to be devoted to thinking about this and figuring out, questioning everything you've been doing already. Um, and maybe the job's been done already. Silencing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, yeah, this is absolutely wonderful, um, and I, I love the connecting history uh, in which we can see the motivations for racial control, you know, so strongly in the historic cases and seeing, seeing that kind of line up. And, and so as you were talking about that, I was thinking this isn't maybe specific to the uh, higher education um, uh, uh, context, but, you know, all public schools that are being affected by this. I, think I was really thinking about that historic pairing of uh, the anti-literacy laws and policies on the one hand with the violence, right? So actually burning down schools, right, et cetera. And so thinking about contemporary, I don't know if you thought at all about kind of contemporary context of that, but for me, um, you know, I mean, increasing uh, school resource officers in schools, right? Um, uh, cops in schools, right? Exerting direct, often violent control over students, the disproportionate number of both school-aged and college-aged uh, uh, kids, black boys in particular, who are in prison, right, and not having access to, despite being mm. school-aged, right, not having access to, you know, the same kind of educational resources. And as Sam suggests, right, there's already control, substantive control over, you know, the kinds of things that can be taught in prison, the kinds of books that you can have, et cetera. So those both felt like kind of contemporary forms of violence, right, that were being paired with these policies. So I don't know if that's uh, an angle that you thought of this yet, but that's... Yeah, yeah, no, and thanks for, for raising that. So you're right. I mean, so there's other policies, but also other practices. And yes, the, you know, the school to prison pipeline, the, which is tied to the school resource officers, which is tied to, uh, I don't know, watching young black men, you know, and women attacked by the police. Like, all of these things are connected. Um, so yeah, and thinking about it some more, I will be looking at, um, you know, additional um, contemporary circumstances that uh, kind of push toward uh, the silences. And I wanted to, oh, just, sorry, just one quick second, thanks. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, it's also the case that a number of states did not have legislation that punished reading or writing, but enslaved persons were aware of what could happen if they were found uh, learning to read or learning to write. So the law, you know, it, the law is one thing, and then sanctions are, you know, uh, are something else in terms of, um, uh, yeah, so where, where things are. So my name is Shania Hernandez. I'm a student here at Northeastern, um, studying international affairs and criminal justice. Are you reading? Okay, there you go. You're reading. Okay, yeah. go for it. Yeah, no, I was and like. Let's... So my question for you is, with consideration to the sharp, with consideration to the sharp political divide in our country today, what do you believe to be the likelihood of Florida's HB7 law turning into a nationwide law? Okay, if you don't mind, can you read that, that I'm sorry. Uh, one more, just a little bit slower for me, please? With yeah. consideration to the sharp political divide in our country today. What do you believe to be the likelihood of Florida's HB7 law turning into a nationwide law? 
Oh, okay, great question. I think, is Adam gonna tell me this to, uh, re oh, okay, 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 great. Um, oh, that's a really good question. Um, so about 20 states already have approximately, um, you know, passed anti-critical race theory legislation. Um, I don't know in terms of, you're meaning like, so that it's like, perhaps maybe dominant, like three-fourths of the states or something like that. I don't know, and it may not even be that it has to be that many more because we're already now, oh, this is maybe this is a safe state or this is, <laughs> right? Um, so I don't know um, whether or not there will be a lot more. Uh, I think a lot's going to depend upon uh, the elections next month and a couple of years. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Thanks. I think the moderator probably could ask one question and then we'll, we'll take a couple more. I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uh, potential co optation of this notion of individual rights in the mm -hmm. language of the law mm -hmm. and particularly the sort of turning on its head the concept of discrimination, right? Mm -hmm. The ways in which we see concepts of individual rights utilized by sort of gun right activists as you know, having a gun mm -hmm. as being an individual right and not being forced to face uncomfortable pasts as being an individual right, that someone has a right to not have to think about race. Yeah, I think we've seen this in other contexts as well, right, in terms of, you know, whether we're talking about um, racial discrimination, right, reverse discrimination, you know, the, the, you know, the language wins the day in terms of uh, whether, not whether, but how we frame what the, um, uh, what the harm is. So, yeah, I think this is part of the progression, and that is you come up with language that sounds like, and that's why I read the um, quote by uh, the historian, um, uh, that these campaigns and, you know, and the, the state is saying, oh, we're doing this to support, you know, we want education for all, we want individual freedom, but that really is grounded in the state determining what that education and what that educational paradigm will look like. So, yeah. Let's see, one last question, Jack. Give me the last question. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, going to where are we going with this mm -hmm. kind of question. I, I'm wondering whether you're seeing it sort of discussed or I saw the employees on the your slides mm -hmm. as a workplace oh, yeah. issue as well. Because mm -hmm. if we think about Massachusetts, our experience here is that there's been lots of DEI kinds of educational um, initiatives been put in place in workplaces across the Commonwealth. And it would seem to fall, most of them will fall a, a skew of what you've just shown us tonight in this incredible talk. Are you seeing anything like that, that in Florida? I'm not sure. Okay, so am I seeing who, uh, that? employer programs are being included oh, in this oh, oh, yes. as oh. education programs. Yeah, and I didn't include that because I was really focusing on um, the classroom. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of what these lawsuits are, is also challenging this, uh, this training, whether or not there can there be DEI training, uh, and if so, what would that look like? Um, so with regard to that, I mean, I think one of the biggest issues with this is this whole law, this whole infrastructure created around the law begs the question of what problem are we solving, right? What professors are going around telling students that they have to believe or have a particular perspective? And even if there are a few, is that what, you know, so, and again, I, you know, one question is whether or not just having this law in place will address the concerns that the law, um, you know, set about to, uh, to solve, so, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I want to take a moment and uh, thank Catherine for being here today for this engaging and depressing, but yeah. engaging. <laughs> enlightening, yeah. enlightening. Yeah. No, right? Engaging. Nobody, nobody looked at the yeah. law, right? Here, okay. For future discussions. Uh, so let's give a quick hand. <laughs> I'm sure people will have.
who would like to stick around and have conversations. Hopefully this is the beginning of conversations, not the end of conversations. But I did want to take this moment to present you with this plaque <laughs> to thank you on behalf of the Center on Crime, Race, and Justice um, and the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Uh, the being the fifth annual Schulman lecturer. Thank you very much. Yes, That's absolutely. Good. Thank you for thank joining you. us today thank and for you. making the trip to Boston. <laughs> thank so, thank you again. Oh, and thanks, thanks everyone so. for being here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>